Well, we're, we're proud to be here today with you guys, and uh, our partnership with TAPS has been a good one these last three years. We're looking forward to several more. Um, we've been trying to schedule and coordinate so we can get Dr. Andrews here uh, for, for the last couple of years, and uh, this is a good opportunity to do that. Um, what we wanted him to speak about today was some just, you know, topics that may relate to you and, and the athlete population that you deal with on a daily basis. Uh, he's seen a little bit of all of it, you know, in the last 30 plus years and uh, still seeing it. So um, <clears throat> he's, he's one of the world's foremost experts in sports injuries from youth all the way up through professional athletes. You know, oftentimes it's like anything, you get a, you get an opportunity to speak when you people respect you for treating pro athletes, but um, working with him since 1991, I can tell you his passion is uh, prevention of injuries in youth sports. And uh, we try to mirror that with everything we do with Children's Health and Andrews Institute. So uh, without further ado, I'll have Dr. Andrews come on up and speak. Well, anytime I get a chance to talk to high school coaches, athletic directors, uh, I jump at it because I know that's where, it's, where it begins and that's where it's most important. So I appreciate what y'all do and I'll try to emphasize that through this presentation. I didn't know quite what to, to talk to you about so it's sort of a hodgepodge so y'all bear with me and, and maybe somewhere along this presentation I can challenge you a little bit. It is a great pleasure for me to present at this TAPS conference. I finally figured out what TAPS sound, uh, stands for, too, so I'm really, I'm really growing up with this abbreviation. I understand TAPS is the largest private school organization in the country. This annual conference is a great example of your commitment to health and safety of your student athletes statewide. That's what it's all about right there. That's why I'm here. The goals of this presentation are, number one, define sports medicine and its role in health and well-being of our student athletes. To discuss the role of the athletic trainers in secondary schools. That's one of my passions, by the way, so y'all bear with me with that. And to discuss why so many of our young athletes are being injured. What about orthopedic sports medicine? Well, that now is a subspecialty of orthopedics takes certification to become a sports medicine specialist. So what is it? It's the care of the muscles, bones, and joints of athletically active individuals, and by the way, that's at all ages. Whatever it is, though, it's a team effort. Sports medicine encompasses a number of medical disciplines, and I'm, what I'm fixing to show you here is a list of those individuals that, that comprise the sports medicine team at the University of Alabama and also at Auburn, where it's, which are two teams that I am work with as orthopedic surgeon. A lot of this medical team trickle down and out from the colleges to high schools, so it's become more and more complicated. As a matter of fact, it's trickling up to, the, to professional football. It didn't trickle down from professional football to colleges. It went the other way, just so you know. Here's the list, and this list grows every time I give this talk. And you can read it yourself. The sports doctor, orthopedist, athletic trainer. And athletic trainer is the glue, by the way. Physical therapist, strength conditioning specialist, medical specialist, hand surgeons, foot and ankle specialist, the neurosurgeon. You know in the NFL now on the sidelines, there's two neurosurgeons on each sideline, one independent one and one that works for the team. And they're there to try to make sure one doesn't push a player back in and shouldn't go play in the game. So it takes two of them now on each sidelines. Then you've got, we have a dentist too that travels with, the sports chiropractor, the massage therapist. Alabama and Auburn both have two full-time nutritionists that travel with the football team. Then we have a sports psychologist that uh, travels particularly with the University of Alabama. We have two EMTs that travel with Alabama. I bet you can't guess what they're there for. Well, they're there, of course, if we have a catastrophic injury on the field, they're, they're, they're used to those type injuries. But what they really do is, is they start the IVs at the halftime because you only have a short period of time to get them back to the coaches for their halftime lecture. So, the EMTs can get the IV started just like that and, and get it moving. That's really what they're doing at the football games with Alabama. Then we have bioengineers and biomechanists 
and other paramedical personnel. So what's happened here, so you know, sports medicine is so subspecialized that the general orthopedist, like when I grew up, I took care of hands, feet, hips, everything. But now there's a specialist in every one of those categories, and I named some of the more important ones here, foot and ankle specialist and hand surgeon, for example. So that's how specialized it's become. What about our priorities related to the responsibilities of the sports medicine team? Well, this is something we have to continually re remind ourselves, and you too, as athletic directors. The number one priority is to the player, obviously, even the high school kid. And then second comes the priority to the parents. And then to the team, the coaches, the management, ownership. Uh, yes, the press becomes complicated, and so as you get into professional sports, you've got to deal with the agents. So it's really a, a complicated mess, if you want to know the truth. Remember this, this is one of the most important things I can say, and it's real important in high school. Remember, if mother ain't happy, nobody's happy. I may have a 29, 30 year old NFL football player come in to see me and fix to operate on him. First thing I want to know, usually the mother's with them. If mother's not with them, their aunt's with them. But if mother's not there, I, first thing I want to know is, where's your, what's your mother's telephone number? And I call her on the, on the cell phone right in front of the in front of the 29-year-old the football player, let her know that I've got her son there and I'm maybe fixed to operate on him so she knows. Now, that's a little bit against some of the HIPAA rules, but I'll talk more about HIPAA rules in a minute. <laughs> if you want to be a non-communicator, uh, then follow the HIPAA rules. For most, sports medicine becomes a passionate hobby and almost a full-time hobby if it's done right. And why do we do it? I just want to make sure that you know your medical staff is there because of community involvement and interest, because we enjoy it. It's the right thing to do, and you're expected to do it voluntarily. This is a gentleman that I trained with who was the, one of the founding fathers of modern sports medicine in the United States. He's the first guy to develop athletic trainers and team physicians on the sidelines at high school football games back in the 1950s. And he was from Columbus, Georgia, took care of Auburn all those years. And I was fortunate enough to study under him. That's Dr. Jack Houston. He's passed away now, obviously. But I learned a lot about taking care of athletes from that gentleman. And the true hallmarks include, probably number one is availability, compassion. By the way, doc, uh, patients don't want to know when you first meet them in an the exam room, they don't want to know how smart you are or, or, or how good a doctor you are. What do they want to know? Where's our sports guy? Our sports psychologist, where'd he go? Is he here? What they want to know is how compassionate you are. Much more important than trying to tell them how, what a great doctor you are. Then you have honesty and communication and true love of being helpful to those who show good sportsmanship. What about the athletic trainer? And I'm harp on this a little bit now. He's the glue that keeps this sports medicine team on track. And these two were two that I worked with when I was a, doing a fellowship at University of Virginia. And that's Dr. Frank McHugh, and he was a one-man band orthopedic surgeon. And on the right is Dr. Joe Geek, who was an athletic trainer and a physical therapist both, which was sort of unheard of in those days, but is common today. And I learned a lot about sports medicine from those two people. By the way, let's talk about the importance of athletic trainers. I know we've already covered that in this conference a little bit, but I want to put my two cents in. There's a need for athletic trainers in all secondary schools. That's the gold standard for sports care, believe me. A new study shows that only 37% of public secondary schools meet the gold standard of care for their athletes. Now, I know y'all are doing a better job than that with TAPS, but we still have a long ways to go. Athletic trainers are needed for prevention, early recognition, treatment of sports injuries before they become more advanced and more severe. In other words, they are early rec 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 recognizers of the injury and can get it treated before it becomes more of a problem. Also, athletic trainers are essential for any form of tracking and surveillance of high school athletic injuries. And I think Chad's gonna talk to, to y'all about some of that when we uh, when I finish, 
Uh, by the way, a national registry for youth sports injuries is well underlay he headlined by R Rank One Health, which Chad is going to talk about. And that is in association with Children's Health at our Andrews Institute in Plano and also with TAPS in the state of Texas. So thank you for getting involved with Rank One and trying to develop a registry of injuries so we know what's really happening out there. By the way, I can't emphasize how important physical therapy is in my practice and in the care of your athletes. And I've often said this, and it's true. For me, rehabilitation is often more important than the actual surgical procedure itself. Try to get operated on and not get rehab. You just got a, just a, a mess. You never are going to really get well, or it's going to take you about 10 times as long. What about the duties of the medical team? This, this is the same thing in high school. And the physicians, athletic trainers, and other paramedical personnel are responsible for the health and well-being of the athlete. That's really sports medicine. The team physician and athletic trainers must be prepared to identify and plan for medical care and services that promote the safety of the athlete, limit injury, provide medical care at the site of practice or competition or thereafter. What that's really saying is you've got to post an act, um, emergency action plan. I don't know how many of y'all are, are really know that, but if you don't have an emergency action plan posted around your high school, then you're in some legal situations if you're really going to be in trouble. It's a, it's a mandatory legal obligation nowadays. When I talked about my mentors, and I learned a little bit about patient philosophy, and I'll run through this real quick just to show you what we think and how we try to take care of athletes. Always be open-minded. That goes with everybody here, not just the doctors and trainers. Do not be the first person to make the big statement. I hope you all understand what I mean by that. That's like making some outlandish statement that will come back to haunt you because things change. By the way, the patient or the athlete is always right. Uh, not always, but <laughs> you might as well approach it that way. You understand what I'm saying? Make the patient feel he's treated properly by his previous physician. Do not say anything bad about another physician, or for that matter, another person. My mother taught me a long time ago when I was a little boy. She called me Jimmy Rubin, and she said to me, Jimmy Rubin, if you can't say something good about somebody, don't say anything. And that stuck with me my entire life. By the way, you need to listen to your athletes and to your patients, if you're athletic trainers. You sit down and listen to them, They'll probably tell you what's wrong, and they'll spill their beans, and, and then you'll be better to take care of them. So listen to the patient. And by the way, your attitude, responsibility, knowledge, desire, and availability are always necessary to be successful. And the thing that's going on today in our world of electronics, medical records, and all is we don't have enough time to really take care of our patients. And one must always be able to read the patient in today's markets, you've got to do it real quick to figure them out, figure out their personalities and motivation. Y'all have to do that as coaches too and as athletic directors. By the way, the physician must be confident with his skills. His confidence is reflected back and perceived by the patient. Try to make every patient or every athlete feel as though they're special. Don't compromise what you do best as a routine for an elite athlete or try to do something extra special beyond your norm. In other words, you take your star athlete, don't try to treat him different than you would somebody down the, the totem pole. Uh, I'll ask you a question. Uh, in other words, don't get fancy. How about some challenges as a team physician and athletic trainer in sports? And I'll show you some of the problems we have out there. And we'll, I don't know if I can give you any answers, but I'll show you some of the challenges. What about pre-participation, medical el eligibility decisions? Who decides, the team physician or, for, or some outside doctor, about whether or not an injury will preclude that player from playing on your team? And I know you athletic directors, even in high school, get caught up in that. Team doctor says it's not safe for him to participate, and the parents go get a second opinion somewhere. The second opinion says, oh, he can play. He's not that badly hurt. And then you're caught as an athletic director with what to do. Well, it's pretty well accepted in the sports medicine world that the head team physician has the final word on disqualification for participation. He can certainly utilize outside consultants to help in his decision, but they can't really 
be the deciding factor. It's the team physician that makes that final decision. And it should take that decision away from you, the athletic director and coach, too. Who decides to return to play after an injury in the heat of the battle or week-to-week -week practice? Well, let's talk about in the middle of a football game, a kid gets hurt. The trainer brings him out on the field, out off to the bench, and you are trying to decide, can he go back and play? Well, absolutely, the answer is the head team position. And if it's not the head team position, it's the next one in line from a medical standpoint, which would probably be the athletic trainer. The team physician must use good judgment, can't be caught up as a fan in the heat of the battle. It's easy to get out there in a, in a playoff game as a doctor and get to uh, hoorah on everybody and, and you make some decisions that aren't real smart yourself. But I can tell you this, the football coach is not the one to, to decide to put somebody back in the game. I tell doctors all the time, if your coach is doing that for you, you need to resign and go find another school to take care of. I'm serious about that. What about the disqualification NCAA rule? This is in college, but it, it's something you need to think about. If an athlete has a medical orthopedic condition of a severe nature that continued participation in that sport would in all likelihood result in adverse long-term sequelae, you can do a medical redshirt on them. The athlete receives the remainder of his educational scholarship. He or she no longer counts against the sport's total scholarship number. He or she cannot take part in another sport at that institution. He or she cannot change their mind and return to play for that institution in, in any sport. He or she can transfer and play for another school. By the way, that's true in all 29 college sports except what? You're probably going to run into this, so you need to know. It, you, it does not, you don't have that in baseball. Don't ask me why. A kid at the University of Alabama playing baseball tears his Tommy John's ligament, can't play next year. He, it, there's no red shirt for him. If, if they give him his, keep his scholarship, it counts against their 11 and a half total. So what do they do? They take his scholarship away. The kid's either got to go home or go to a junior college or his parents have to pay for him to stay in school. And boy, the parents are mad in hell about it. You can understand why. That's baseball, only baseball. Even the equestrians can get a medical red shirt and keep their scholarship for a year. What about, we talked about HIPAA. Well, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, of course, it counts in high school. And the athletic director should know all about this. It regulates the way the team physician and members of the health care team communicate and handle patient medical information. By the way, the HIPAA law is a real paradox in this communication age of the new millennium. It certainly makes life difficult for the sports medicine team because you're so limited in putting out information. Unless you have written consent, you can't even let the parents know about it. I know we have to abide by federal regulations, but as, but as with all of us in sports medicine, the HIPAA rule gets in, it certainly gets in my way. I don't know about yours, but you have to go by it. Here's a, a, a challenging health care goal. I'll show you one little thing that comes up in high school all the time. This is a case presentation. I know you athletic directors have been through some of this. Coaches, too. The star college or high school running back is hurt. could be either way. It's playoff time. Rapid rehabilitation may do it. Get him back at all costs. Pressure, pressure. Remember, he's your star, and the next game is maybe the championship game. New healing enhancement miracle drugs are exciting and hopefully spectacular. They're usually not scientifically proven, though, regardless of what the newspaper will say. Not proven to be helpful and may even be harmful. But that's always going to come up for you. Sensationalism for the player and to the pub public is a big problem. If severe enough, this urgent injury may require a surgical decision. That decision is complicated by what's best for the long haul and career of that player versus versus what gets the player back quickest for the playoffs. And a good example of that is a torn medial meniscus. Now, he might be able to play with a little small tear with rehab with no surgery, 
Uh, if he's got a bucket handle tear, which I'm sure you all have heard of, the big question, if you take out the operate on him on Sunday morning and take the handle out, they probably can play next Saturday or Friday, whatever it is. If you repair it like you're supposed to, he can't play for four months. So what do you do? You do what's best for his long haul and for his career in high school, for what, what may be his career in college. So you have to repair it if it's repairable, and that does not, does not allow him to play next week. But that's a big problem, big challenge. The lesson to learn, be learned in this case presentation is the medical team must inform the patient of his options and at all times inform him of what is best for his career over the long haul. Here's the thing, though. The bottom line, though, is doing what's best for the player in the long run is usually what's best for the team itself. Here's what I see happen. You got your star player who's may, maybe can play, but he's not 100%. And the coach is going to put him back in there because he's the star player, and he's probably not near as good as the guy that's right behind him in the, in, in the, on the second team. But they play him at, not le at less, less than 100%. That sort of happened the other night in that NBA game, if you remember what I'm talking about. And in playing that player, they lose the game because he's not really able to really play and help the team. In dealing with these challenging issues, the team position gets caught in the middle, believe me. And the art is keeping both the player and the team happy. It's like playing both ends from the middle. You have to be a little bit of a politician to be able to get through all that. But do what's best for the player, all of you. That brings up medical ethics and professionalism in sports medicine. The orthopedic profession exists for the primary purpose of caring for the patient. The physician-patient relationship is the central focus of all ethical concerns. And that goes with high school athletes and the team physician also. The orthopedic surgeon should be dedicated to providing competent medical service with compassion and respect. The Committee on Ethics for our Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons recommended that sports medicine team not use publicity in an untruthful, misleading, or deceptive manner. You really have to be careful about your press releases and your publicity as a physician. By the way, to be successful in sports medicine, just like you as athletic directors, you must also be successful in medical economics. But never let economics interfere with doing what's best in the medical care for the patient or the athlete. I don't know what y'all's rules are with your organization, but I've, I've got three different sports clinics in three different states. And uh, we've always had the rule that if a kid got hurt in high school athletics, regardless of where they were, it was supposed to be in that state, but it went outside of that state occasionally. We would take care of that high school athlete, what we call win, lose, or draw. It means we do him free. And I've seen some of those kids that we did in high school go on to college and professional sports and become model citizens some 15 years after they did a 15-year NFL career because we operated on them as a senior in high school and we did it without charging them anything. That's just something you need to do. Uh, we have a rule that says give something away free every day that you practice medicine. Even if it's a Band-Aid, give something away free. What about team coverage? I know y'all deal with this, even in high school now. We got doctors fighting over coverage of a high school. When I came along, we, we had 10 or 12 high schools didn't have a doctor, and I could take care of all 10 of them. But that's not the way it is today. So we had to establish some guidelines for covering coverage of high schools and colleges and pros. Selection of a team physician, for example, and y'all need to understand this because team physicians, uh, athletic directors sometimes make these decisions. It should be based upon sports medicine capabilities through the individual that can give you the best medical care. It shouldn't be a social, a, so, a social decision. It shouldn't be the one that gives you the most money. The selection of team medical staff should, be based, should not be based on financial incentives offered by the physician and or his or her institution. Get the best care you can. You're going to do the best you can for the athlete if you do that. What about remuneration as a team physician? If possible, the team physician should be a voluntary participant. 
If the team physician becomes a paid employee on contract, then his ethics will be challenged. They should never allow themselves to be considered in the back pocket of club management. That's particularly true in the professional ranks. Of course, a voluntary position is not always possible due to time away from one's formal practice and a secondary loss of revenue. So especially in the professional sports, remuneration for many hours of service is a, is, is a necessity. I've been team position for two different NF, uh, professional football teams, and personally I've never accepted any kind of remuneration from either one of them. It's a strictly voluntary thing, and uh, I want to keep it that way. If you're in the back pocket of your of, of team and they're paying you, the athletes and their agents will send, you, send their injured athletes somewhere else usually. By the way, here's where my real passion is, and it, what, I say, what I'm saying here is why are so many of our young athletes getting injured? I began to notice the problem with the escalation of youth injuries in sports in about year 2000. We tracked those injuries at our foundation in Pensacola and in Birmingham, and since then we've shown that the injury rates in youth sports has gone up tenfold since year 2000. That means it's an epidemic of injuries. Children have become more and more vulnerable in a $5 billion youth sports injury, and this has a lot to do with what's going on out there. There are 30 to 45 million young athletes in the U.S. I think half of those are in the Dallas market, by the way. <laughs> Unbelievable. Statistics show this, and by the way, my, my grandson and granddaughter are in that market, too. That's why I really got interested in building that new facility over there with y'all at Children's Health, <laughs> to make sure they were taken care of. Statistics show that sports is the leading cause of adolescent injury, by the, according to the CDC. Young athletes are specializing in sports and positions at earlier age with more than 3.5 million children under the age of 14 treated annually for sports injuries, according to Safe Kids USA. Immature bones, insufficient rest after injury, poor training and conditioning contribute to overuse injuries. Overuse injuries account for half of all sports injuries in, in middle school and high school. So it's the number one thing you have to worry about. These kids are particularly at risk in, the, in, in this epidemic. Improper technique is still probably number one. That's where you coaches come in. Ill-fitting equipment, training errors, and then the big one is coach parental pressure. Failure of early injury recognition, that means not having an athletic trainer around when all this is going on. Shift to single sport specialization and the inherent muscular and musculoskeletal imbalance that these young kids have. These problems are magnified because the younger the athlete, the more vulnerable they are to injury. I used to think just the opposite, but that's not true. The two major causes that we talk about all the time, number one is specialization. That means playing one sport year-round. Y'all know the problem with that, I'm sure. Then what we call professionalism. I'm not sure you understand what I mean by that, but professionalism means you're training a kid like he's a professional athlete, and he may be four or five years old, and he's not ready for that type of intense training in one sport. By the way, parents and athletes feel the pressure to compete at all costs. I want to talk a little bit about sports sampling, and I hope you understand what I mean by that. If you don't, listen to this because it's real important. One of the major ways of prevention of these youth sports injuries is sports sampling. Young athletes should be developed as athletes first. They should have at least two months, preferably three to four months off each year from a specific sport for rest and recuperation. We even do that in our farm fields. We don't keep farming the same thing every year in the same field, do we? Even the Bible says Sabbath day should be a day of rest. Here's an article on sports sampling. It was in the pediatric journal. It said sports sampling should be promoted in childhood because it may be linked to higher physical activity levels during adolescence. In other words, if they don't get into doing some type of sport when they're young, they won't do it later on in life. There are five reasons parents should want their kid to be a multi-sport athlete. That's what we call sports sampling. 
you know, when I grew up, we had seasonal sports. We did football, basketball, track, and then baseball. And then we worked in the hay fields the rest of the summer. <laughs> but there are five reasons you ought to make sure that your kids or your grandkids or your, your, your athletes participate in sports sampling. Fewer overuse injuries, number one. A lack of rest and recovery time in a year-round sport exacerbates overuse. Less opportunity for emotional burnout. Here's a good statistic for you. Approximately 70% of our young athletes are dropping out of sports by age of 13, dropping out now, completely quit, due to specialization, professionalism, and pressure from coaches and parents. They just pure out, purely burn out today in today's athletic world. And these children lo then lose the benefit of exercise, teamwork, and healthy competition. The other thing is exposure to different kinds of kids as friends. And then they have exposure to different roles in sports. And they're not putting all of their eggs in one basket. I don't care how good a, a parent you are, you really don't know which sport is this kid going to be best at as he matures into high school, particularly as a senior. You'd be surprised some of the young baseball kids I see, 13, 14 years old, and they already hurt, and their parents are so wrapped up in baseball. And I look at those little kids, and I say to myself, this kid hadn't got a chance in hell of ever being a, a real baseball player. But nobody will tell them that. Here's a little statistic that's important. Look at this. This is sports sampling, multi-sport stars, and being an athlete first. 222 of the 253 players selected in the 2017 NFL draft played more than one sport in high school. Here's another one. This came out of Super Bowl 53. More than 90% of Super Bowl 53 players were multi-sport athletes in high school. That's 90% of the 106 players that were on the two rosters for the Super Bowl. And a good example of that is Tom Brady. For example, played football, basketball, and baseball in high school. I want to show you this national questionnaire that, that we helped with Safe Kids Worldwide, which is a product of Johnson & Johnson. This national questionnaire was done on a, nation, on a nationwide uh, questionnaire by Safe Kids, and it tells you a little bit about the culture of youth sports. Bear with me here. 1.24 million kids were seen in emergency rooms for sports injuries back in year 2013. Among children aged 19 and under, the 13 to 15 year olds accounted for the largest number of injuries. So the younger these kids were, the, more, the higher number of injuries they had. 90% of athletes said they had been injured while playing a sport, 90%. Of course, the number one injury was sprains and strains, which com comprised 37% of the total. Now, here's some of the interesting things we found out. 54% of the athletes said they had played injured. We asked why. I bet you can, can tell me what the first one was. It says, I was needed and couldn't let the team down. I didn't want to be benched. And it was an important game. I went through that last week with my little grandson in, in Birmingham playing fourth grade baseball. I told him he couldn't play, and I got out there, and his daddy, who's coaching him, already had him pitching. But anyway, that's a whole other story. <laughs> By the way, fewer than half of the coaches say they have received certification on how to prevent and recognize sports injuries. I don't know how many coaches we have here, but I just want to say one thing personally to you. You got to understand the liability that you're facing nowadays. And if you don't have certification and you don't have some, something that says you have passed an exam to treat basic sports medicine injuries, the lawyers are going to be looking up and down trying to find you if you get somebody hurt. That's particularly true in these volunteer coaches that are usually dads or uncles or whatever, but the liability is there. By the way, 80% of parents said they would want their child's coach to be certified in injury prevention. 
yet in our questionnaire only 50% of the, of the coaches were certified. We'll talk to you in just a second about what we've done to, to help that certification. By the way, more than half of the coaches, 53%, say they have felt pressure from a parent or a player to put an athlete back into a game if a child had been injured. I know y'all have all faced that. Parents raising hell because you took them out of the game. So you got all that problem out there in front of you. What about the risk of injury? Well, if you look on your right over there, if you've got grandkids or your own kids, where do you want to put them to have the lowest injury rate? Co-ed golf. If you're a female golf player and you play high school golf, you almost have a guarantee you'll get a college scholarship. Co-ed tennis, co-ed swimming. But look over here on the left. Female cross country is the highest rate. But that, those are usually not terribly bad injuries, but they're stress fractures and this, that, and the other. But, but that, that has the highest injuries. But the problem is, look at the second one, is what? We'll talk about that in a minute. Football. We've got to do something about that, Coach. Or we won't have football. I'll show you what's already happening out there in a minute. Here's a few examples as I wrap up. How much time we have left? I said I wasn't going to talk for 30 minutes, and here I am ad-libbing. I'm just going to show you a couple of things. One is the adolescent baseball throwing arm and what's happening to it. And I want to talk to you about softball, because softball is neglected, believe me. The adolescent throwing elbow uh, in youth baseball, our stats at ASMI, our foundation in Birmingham, indicate there's been a 7 to 10-fold increase in throwing arm injuries since year 2000. This is a, a good example of what year-round baseball is producing. And this is a 15-year-old kid, and you look here, he's happy, his parents are, are smiling, because they finally found somebody that would fix his broken elbow. And they're just dying to get operated on, by the way. You can't hardly run them out of your office. This kid's 15 years old. What positions do you think he plays? Pitcher, catcher. I'm emphasizing that because that's been outlawed in most of youth sports. You really got to be careful with that, you coaches and athletic directors, letting the kid be the pitcher and, and the catcher at the same time and switching them back and forth because the injury rates go way up. We don't allow that at all in most youth sports organizations anymore. This kid has a history, two years of chronic pain. Now he's, that was when he was 13 when it started. He's now unable to play. If you look at that arrow on your left there, it points to that, see that little bony ossification where that arrow is pointing? That's a, a, a revulsion of part of the bone attached to his ulnar collateral ligament, his Tommy John's ligament, where he pulled it off. No telling when that happened. Probably he was 12. If you look at the back of his elbow, the next blue arrow, you see that tip of the bone there it's pointing to? That's an electronon stress fracture of the bone from throwing. And that's chronic, and, and there's now a non-union there, if you see that space. And that's almost unfixable. If you look at his MRI on your right over there where they are, you see the white? That's fluid leaking that we put in his elbow, leaking right through the torn ligament down into the soft tissue. So he's got a complete tear of his Tommy John's ligament. What do you think the odds are of me fixing that elbow and that kid continue to play baseball up the ladder would be? Better, better hope they brought his preacher with him. What about prevention studies in baseball? We've worked on that, and we've, as I said, I've been passionate about trying to prevent injuries in youth sports. We've worked closely with USA Baseball and the International Little League, and I was on their board for a number of years on both of them in trying to prevent injuries in youth sports. We, we published a bunch of papers that are prevention-type papers. This, this are two of them, just two examples. The first one was published in the Journal of Sports Medicine, peer-reviewed. The second one was, too. And they're talking about the effect of pitch type, pitch count, and pitching mechanics on risk of elbow and shoulder injury and risk factors associated with shoulder and elbow injuries in these young pitchers. And to make a long story short, here's what we found out. I thought surely this would make a dent when I talked to parents and grandparents. But we found out the take-home message in these studies showed that if a young pitcher throws with fatigue, that means too many innings in a game, 
too many pitches in a game, too many innings in a season, and, uh, and too many uh, and playing year round. Any, any form of fatigue associated with that. He has a 36 to 1 times risk of injury to his shoulder or elbow, throwing shoulder or elbow. That's a 3,600% interest. So the two things y'all need to know, watch out for if you're baseball coaches in, in high school or whatever, two big things are fatigue and velocity. And if you're trying to push those two things, you're almost going to be sure they're going to tear their Tommy John's ligament. We made the following recommendations and position statements, by the way, which are out there. This is USA Baseball, which is the governing body of amateur baseball in the U.S. These guidelines were presented in 2004, and they're still there. Pitch count chart, we, do, we recommend. Pitches per game, season, and year, mandated, particularly for ages 9 to 14. Discourage breaking pitches. I was at my little grandson's game, playoff game last Saturday morning. And the, the dads were the coaches, and the, the opposing team, little pitcher was out there, and I started noticing nobody could hit him. He was throwing, a, and I talked to the umpire behind the plate, who was a friend of mine. I'd operated on him when he played baseball in college. I asked him at the, between innings, what in the world is that guy, that kid doing? About every other pitch he was, he was nine years old, every other pitch he was throwing was a curveball, called by his dad, the coach. I told my grandson if I caught him throwing a, a break, breaking ball, he wasn't going to play any more baseball, period. The other problem is multiple leagues where nothing counts because you, you can't keep up with anything. They're playing two leagues at the same time. Show cases are, are show out cases, and they're terrible for injury. And of course, you're around baseball, and we encourage good mechanics, good conditioning. Uh, from these studies and recommendations, the Little League International was the first youth baseball organization to adopt pitch count rules. Yes, the coaches didn't like it. Since then, many other youth baseball organizations and the National High School Athletic Association have followed suit. Y'all know that? The only thing that they, that they mandated it, but they left it up to each state as to determine how many pitches would be pitched. So some of the states are cheating the way they, but you can't go by innings. You gotta go by how many pitches they throw if you wanna be safe. But we made some progress in it. In addition, Major League Baseball has also developed a comprehensive preventative youth baseball program. And if y'all don't know about this, look it up on uh, www.majorleaguebaseball.com, Pitch Smart. And it's called the Pitch Smart Program. And that we, we, I'm on their research committee, and we finally got Major League Baseball to get behind youth sports. Because they carry a big stick, and parents will listen to some of these Major League players. But anyway, they have a program now and Major League Baseball and USA Baseball have recognized the amateur and professional organizations that have fully adopted the Pitch Smart Compliance Program and its guidelines for the 2019 season. So it's having some traction. This group includes 28 national and regional organizations in youth baseball that have followed suit and become fully compliant according to those guidelines. That's the first big step we made with youth baseball. This involves incorporation of pitch, pitch smart guidelines pertaining to pitch counts, rest periods, and other pitch smart, smart educational efforts. Quickly run through softball. Youth and college softball are almost exclusively, as you know, a female sport. I've often been quoted as saying that softball is the most neglected of all youth sports. It probably is. The number one myth related to fast pitch softball is throwing underhanded is a, is a normal motion it does not contribute to injury. That's just not true. Come, come to my office and I'll spend a week with me and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Because of this, softball lags behind all other youth sports in injury rate, recognition, and injury for prevention safety rules. Therefore, softball injuries are on the rise and have reached epidemic proportions, particularly at the early youth development age. This is some of the injuries we see in softball, which are the same injuries we see in baseball. Uh, one of the problems we're seeing in youth softball, for those of you that take care of, your, of a softball team, is problems with the long head of the biceps tendon, particularly in the windmill pitcher. And real quickly, this is a senior college windmill pitcher. I want to, I'll just show you, if you look at her on your left, you look at her bulge of her biceps muscle, this 
hanging down low and, is, and she's torn the biceps tendon up above from windmill pitching. Look at it on the right when she makes a Popeye muscle, you can see that on the right. MRI indicated the tear, I won't bore you with that. We had to operate on her, sculpt her, repaired her biceps tendon and Tina deced it back to the bone. Her, 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 she was a senior, so her competitive softball career is over with, but that's just one example of what's happening throwing a windmill uh, softball. By the way, softball is notorious for having a vigorous schedule. Some athletes play as, as many as up to six games in a weekend. The pitcher usually throws, a seven, throws 70 to 120 pitches. Sometimes they'll throw up to 250. I've had, a, I've had some that went to 300 pitches in one game. As, uh, also due to the relatively few pitchers on a team, a single pitcher is often required to pitch two or three games in a competitive series. Because of this workload, the female windmill pitcher sustains a significantly higher injury rate playing softball now than boys do participating in baseball. It's hard to believe that, but that's true. At Auburn University, uh, Gretchen here, Oliver, is our biomechanist, athletic trainer, by the way, and we're working on almost so solely in our biomechanics lab at Auburn on trying to figure out what to do about softball injuries. I think she's been remarkable what she's been able to develop and publish. One of the things we've, we've got now is a pitch count for youth softball, and I won't bore you with this, but it depends on age. Eight, eight to 10, for example, should only throw 50 pitches per game. It goes all the way up to age 15 and over, 100 pitches in a game. And then the pearls for prevention of injuries in softball, you should warm up properly, stretching, running, and easy gradual throwing. All these things are common sense. Coaches should rotate pitches to other positions. Additionally, the pitcher and catcher should not necessarily switch positions. You should concentrate on age-appropriate pitching. Daddies are locked in with their little young softball female players, and they're having them do all these adult college-type pitches when they're eight, nine years old, and they're not ready for it. Don't allow a pitcher to play with pain. Pitchers should not throw on more than two consecutive days until age 13. To avoid fatigue and burnout, don't play year-round. By the way, the radar gun should be outlawed both in, in high school baseball and in softball. Should definitely not be used until the pitcher is a minimum of 15 years old. And they should develop skills that are age appropriate. What about football? I just got a couple of slides. We, we're about finished. Uh, football is king in this part of the country, and it's always been king with me, too. I don't know what I'd do without it. But reportedly, one in every three high school football players will be sidelined secondary to injury. How can football injuries be prevented? Well, you can't prevent all of them. Number one is a preseason health and wellness evaluation. Proper warm up and cool down. Incorporate strength training and stretching. Hi hydrate adequately. Stay active during the summer break. Wear properly fitted protective equipment. Tackle with the head up, do not lead with the helmet. And speak with a sports medicine professional or athletic trainer if you have concerns. I don't know how many of y'all, are y'all doing what we call medical timeout at football games? Real important. That was developed by Dr. Jim Kyle, who's an emergency room physician in the state of West Virginia. And also along with Ron Corson, who's the athletic trainer PT with, at uh, head of at the University of Georgia. Medical timeout should be the norm before all football games. We even do that now at the, at the professional rank. But if y'all don't understand what that is, look it up and you should definitely, that allows you to get together before the, the kickoff and decide what are you gonna do if there's an emergency, where is the x-ray, where's the EMTs, et cetera. That's what we call medical timeout. You already heard about concussions from this young man down here. And uh, I'll just say this, concussions are three times higher in high school than college. That's where they begin, right, Steve? I hope I'm right. This man knows all about it right here. I hope y'all heard some of his lecture. The number one prevention solution, though, is to limit contact in practice to one to two days per week or perhaps no contact. That's never gonna happen in Texas. It happened, it, that's being done in the Ivy League, so they don't have any contact during the week. 
And by the way, if you're not careful, here it comes. What? Flag football. My little grandson in uh, Dallas is playing flag football. And I don't know if you know it or not, but the NFL has a new project now to eliminate tackle football up to age 14. Y'all know about that? That's being developed by the NFL and uh, one of your ex-Dallas Cowboy players uh, played strong safety for the Cowboys, a patient of mine. He's in charge of it. And they're going to develop a national program and, and not allow tackle football to be done until after age 14. That's, under, that's, that's being done right now. By the way, we all agree that time is right to make a major impact in prevention, and it's our responsibility, all of you, to try to get involved in prevention. By the way, if you can camouflage the word prevention into performance, you can make it go a lot further. You understand what I'm saying? Because it is, prevention is related to performance. Not an easy task. Well, how do we, how do we go forward? Well, I'll quickly show you. This is a stop program that I started when I was president of our sports medicine society, and it's a national initiative at the grassroots level. Stop stands for sports trauma and over overuse prevention in youth sports. And I want to skip through some of this, but you can look that up yourself. It's on www.stopsportsinjuries.org and you can become a collaborative, a collaborative partner as seen here and you get all kinds of information and educational e effort. You can have uh, town hall meetings on Saturday afternoon with parents to talk about prevention. We now have 1,100 collaborative partners with us. And here's the last thing I'm going to show you and I want to talk to you a little bit about youth coaches. There's a need for accreditation for all youth coaches on prevention and recognition. And what can be done? In the state of Alabama, we have finally been successful in mandating this accreditation for youth coaches. Mandating it through the state legislature. The law was passed in April 2018, mandating that all paid and unpaid youth coaches must pass a two-hour free internet, free internet course on prevention and recognition before they can coach. Then they have to take a refresher exam at the, on a yearly basis. And if they don't do that in the state of Alabama, they can't coach. And this curriculum and this course was provided by Andrew Sports Medicine, both in Birmingham and in Pensacola. And Chad Gilliland down here is the one who put all that, that test together. Uh, by the way, we're working on that being done in the state of Texas. Uh, it takes some politicking to get it done, believe me. We're working on it get being done in Georgia, Florida, uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas. And then through the National uh, Society of Youth Sports, which governs all of youth sports, we're trying to get it done uh, uh, across the board in all 50 states. So if y'all have any influence, think about it, help us with it in the state of Texas. Here's the last thing. On the other side of the corner, there's an, another youth sports problem we have to deal with. I bet you can't guess what this is. The problem has an incredible impact. Poor kids are being priced out of expensive youth sports. These kids cannot afford to keep up with the socioeconomic aspects of youth sports. I mean, what is a metal bat in a young kid? What does it cost? Y'all know? They want the most expensive one you can get, too. $400 or so. My little grandson's got it. They all wear a backpack and they have two bats in the back of their back. I asked my grandson, well, why do you need two of those expensive bats? He said, well, it looks cool. Anyway, most lower income families, unfortunately, are unable to sign their kids up for youth sport leagues. They're not able to afford league cost, not able to afford equipment, and some certainly can't afford the transportation that's necessary to get their kids all over the place for practice and games. And a novel solution was done in a metropolitan city. And th there is an answer that will help eliminate this financial barrier. You need to develop a waiver which adds a checkbox to the sign-up forms. It says, I'm a resident of the city and I'm requesting a waiver of all fees. In a pilot project in a metropolitan city in the Northeast, 
where this was developed, participation for children who attended high poverty schools shot up almost 80%. This just shows you the joy of sports medicine. Don't let anyone tell you that winning is not important. And I'm sure the Bruins from last night would tell you, they said, well, they won a bunch already, but I can tell you, they, didn't, they, didn't wanna, they wanna win again, and I'm sure that's all part of it. Winning cures a lot of our problems. What about the future? Well, our future in sports medicine is also unbelievable and just around the corner, and I'm sure that it is also purpose-driven. By the way, sports medicine is a field of rapid technolo technological advancements. Natural environment for a rush to judgment, use in which research and evidence-based medicine lags behind. Patient outcomes are needed, and that's why we need this, this uh, questionnaire, this, uh, what you call it, that y'all are doing with children's, where we have a registry of injuries, so we know. Well, that's real important. Thank y'all for getting involved in that. By the way, I'm often asked about the best advice I was ever, I was ever given in sports medicine. And it, in my case, it came from my wife, Janelle, when she said, remember, if you're still talking about what you did yesterday, you're not doing much today. By the way, we're proud that we have this relationship in partnership with TAPS and Children's Health Andrews Institute to really influence the importance of injury prevention in youth sports. Thank you all for allowing me to present this to you. Remember our motto is keep our kids out of the operating room and on the playing field. Thank you very much.